Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into another episode of the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. I'm your co-host, Lolita, also joined by Kyle. On today's show, we have Andrew Keel joining us. Andrew, welcome to the show. How are you this morning? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Before we get started, here's a little bit about Andrew. Andrew is the owner of Keel Team LLC, and his team currently manages 14 manufactured housing communities across six different states. His expertise is in turning around undermanaged manufactured housing communities by utilizing proven systems to maximize the occupancy while reducing operating costs. These consist of implementing utility buildback programs and Im improving overall management and operating efficiencies. Well, now that we have the attention of all the operators listening on this podcast, Andrew, could you please tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you currently do? Yeah, so I started out uh, actually wholesaling and flipping real estate in the central Florida area. Uh, came across through my marketing efforts, I came across two individual mobile homes and I didn't know what to do with them, but I, I, I knew it was a good deal. They were 1990s, you know, vinyl siding, shingle roof homes, uh, but I wanted to find a way to profit from them. So I got on Google, our trusted, trusted ally nowadays, you know, <laughs> you Google everything, right? So I got on Google, ended up on a YouTube channel, uh, watching a guy named Lonnie Scruggs uh, talk about Deals on Wheels and his book and uh, how you can make money, mailbox money, from individual mobile homes. So I ended up buying those mobile homes for like, it was 2200 bucks for both of them. And then I didn't have to do anything. I ended up selling them for like $2,000 down each and then $250 a month for five years. So I was able to create good, consistent cash flow, uh, and I ended up doing that about 19 times with individual mobile homes. During the process, I met a mobile home park owner uh, that actually sent me a couple individual mobile home deals that he wanted me to rehab in his park. And we went out to lunch, and he told me, hey, you know, the real value is in the land, not in the individual mobile homes, just from the tax benefits and, you know, better debt, et cetera. So uh, that was like an aha moment for me. I instantly went uh, to uh, the MHU boot camp and a couple other mobile home park investing educational seminars, uh, started cold calling park owners, and eventually found my first park in Edwardsville, Illinois. Uh, one of the one of my investors on that deal, the, the only one actually, was at the MHU boot camp, and I contacted him he brought the money. I was the sweat equity partner and we got our first deal done. Since then, we've brought on other you know, private equity partners and we've scaled it up now to 16 communities. So, uh, you know, really excited about that. We, we come in, a lot of our mobile home parks that we buy are, you know, owned by mom and pop owners. And there's about 44,000 mobile home parks in the nation. And out of those, you know, not as many are over 50 lots. So a lot of the parks that are owned right now are owned by private individuals and they're not maximizing, you know, the efficiencies of the park. They're not, they're usually self-managing and, you know, we just bought a park uh, about a month ago from a couple that they were doing all the rehabs themselves, you know, and they're in their seventies. They're doing all the work, you know, collecting the rent, everything. So, you know, they had inefficiencies in their business model. We come in you know, implement professional management and, you know, increase the NOI, which ultimately increases the asset value. So that's, that's a little bit about my business and what, what we do. Nice. Congrats on your success for sure. So today, obviously we're going to talk about mobile home parks. So why would someone want to invest passively in a mobile home park? I think, you know, when, uh, from the outside looking in mobile home parks may get a bad rap. And so the first thing that you think of is not something that you may invest in. So why would people want to invest in mobile home parks? Sure. That's a great question. You know, first off, there's the stigma, right? Of living in a mobile home and you don't want to, you know, you hear this trailer trash, you know, there's, there's these TV shows, you know, Trailer Park Boys, you know, Eight Mile. They kind of paint this picture that trailer parks and mobile home parks are this god awful place. When in all reality, you know, it's not like that at all. Uh, so there's that stigma, which kind of scares away some investors. One of the first people that I approached about investing in mobile home parks uh, was like a family friend, you know, very, very, very wealthy, probably the wealthiest, wealthiest, you know, family that my family knows. 
And I approached him, you know, invited him out to lunch and said, hey, would you be interested in, you know, investing in this mobile home park with me? And he said, Andrew, I love you, but there's no way in there's no way I'm investing in a trailer park with you, uh, which was kind of shocking. So that stigma kind of scares away some investors. But main reasons of why someone would want to invest in a mobile home park, you know, it's it's supply and demand. You know, there's limited supply and there's insane amount of demand. And that's something that I realized when I was selling those individual mobile homes. Uh, it's very hard. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but only a handful of mobile home parks are developed every year where about 20 to 30 are torn down every year and redeveloped into something different. So there's, there's shrinking supply because local municipalities don't want mobile home parks in their, their area. I mean, it's a, it's a loss leader for them because, you know, if you think about the average cost annually to put a child through the education system, it's about $11,000 a year where the, the taxes that mobile home residents pay is only around $40 a year. You know, so they're losing money by having mobile home parks in their municipality. And then also, you know, there's the health care that comes with it because a lot of people don't have health insurance that live in mobile home parks and they just go into the ER. Uh, and then also, you know, not a lot of people want to live next to a mobile home park. You know, there's not in my backyard type of mentality. So those are some reasons of why it's a moated investment. And it's also, you know, somewhat recession proof because it is the most affordable form of housing in the United States. And, you know, site built housing right now is being built on average for around $107 a square foot. Manufactured housing is being built for around $49 a square foot. So it's a very affordable solution. Uh, and it's, it's also, there's a lot of meat on the bone in terms of increasing NOI to increase asset value because of you know, the mom and pop owners and, you know, inefficiencies in the marketplace. With the shrinking market size, do you ever foresee mobile home parks going away completely? I don't. I don't think that would ever happen. I mean, there is some new things, some new technology with tiny homes and things like that. But I don't know if you guys have looked into tiny homes. They're not the most affordable things in the world. I mean, I've mm -hmm. seen tiny homes for 70, 80, $100,000. So manufactured homes where you can buy a brand new one for around $30,000 is very affordable and you know you get you get a, a lot of bang for your buck. Okay. What's the perfect type of market for mobile home parks? I'm sure, you know, with so many MSAs out there, there's probably a certain type of market that you look for that is is perfect for this type of asset class. Yeah, I mean the higher the population the better, you know, in in all reality. Uh now there is competition in this marketplace, just like any any other asset class. Uh, but what I've found to be my sweet spot is the Midwest kind of tertiary markets, uh, fifty thousand in population or more, uh, average home price of a hundred thousand or higher. It's just a it's a good sweet spot where we just get extremely high demand, and it just makes sense for the end user to live in a mobile home versus go and rent an apartment that's three times what their lot rent would cost. Okay. And so since our uh, podcast is about educating passive investors, what are, if someone wants to invest in a mobile home park with a sponsor, what are some of the major hurdles that sponsors deal with when it comes to mobile home parks specifically that maybe they should be made aware of? Yeah. Some of the major hurdles that they could be, you know, they could come across uh, is like when a, when a sponsor tries to manage a, a huge turnaround project from far away, you know, when we manage a turnaround project, we move on site for the first couple of months of ownership, and then we visit the property every quarter. Now, some sponsors, you know, purchase a park five, six states away, and they expect to rehab 10 to 20 units and bring in new homes. And we've just, from personal experience, found that to be very difficult because when you're not there every day, you're trusting an on-site manager, which is usually a tenant, to really be a project manager and tell you how the contractors are performing and, you know, be be your eyes and ears but their experience level is not as a project manager so you're kind of expecting too much of them and that's where we've ran into trouble is when we were not on site as much okay and i was going to ask this later on but i might as well skip to it now you mentioned that you actually move on site to the mobile home park so are you living in a mobile home uh yourself for a couple of months i'm not we usually get an airbnb uh near the property uh when I bought a property last year in Ohio, I actually, there was, a, there was a house in front of the park that I moved into with my wife and daughter and uh, my vice president of operations. Uh, and that, 
you know, we learned a lot from that experience, but also you're always on call, you know, whether it's 10 PM, someone gets off work, they're going to come to your door because they want to you know, give you rent and talk to you. So we've learned to just be close to the property. So we're in close proximity. We can get there daily, but we're not, you know, there at 2 AM when someone can just bang on our door and, uh, you know, disrupt us in the middle of the night. Right. Okay. So can you talk a little bit more about how you drive the NOI? I mean, we talk a lot about multifamily and driving NOI, but I'm sure it's a little bit different when it comes to mobile home parks, some of the challenges that you can see, but also, you know, how do you end up driving the NOI? What's the top three things that you do to drive NOI for a mobile home park? Yeah. Number one is occupancy, increasing occupancy. You know, if you have a mobile home on a lot and it's not occupied, that is a, that you're getting zero dollars out of that for your NOI. So that is worth absolutely nothing, like absolutely nothing when you're looking at the value of the total property, if you were to go sell it. Now, if you fill that lot, it's worth on average around 30 to $35,000. So we keep that in the back of our mind when we're, you know, occupying homes, uh, being creative to increase occupancy, obviously bringing in used homes, new homes, etc. Number two uh, is collections you know, enforcing collections, a lot of mom and pop owners, we just purchased a property in Springfield, Illinois, and the owner would actually go door to door to collect his rent every month. And he wondered why he didn't collect all of his rent until, you know, the, the very last day of the month is because he couldn't always reach them when he decided to go door to door to collect his rent. So we, we implement systems like pay lease, where people can pay with, with cash at a Walmart or credit card. Uh, we also, uh, look at water sewer. That's, that would be the number three. Uh, a lot of these parks are master metered. So they get one bill for the water and sewer from the local municipality. Uh, and a lot of the owners, since they've owned these parks for a long time, they haven't kept up with the increases in utility costs. So we'll buy a property and every, every month their water sewer bill is $4,000, but they're only billing back the tenants for one or $2,000. So they're losing money every month. So we'll come in you know, increase the, the, the rates at which they're charging to whatever the local municipality is. And, you know, usually that'll save quite a bit right off the top. How about moving in, or actually, let me start here first. Do you purchase parks that are just the lots or do you purchase the homes on the lots too? Because I know there's two different ways to go about that. Yeah, so we, we believe in the lot rent model where the tenant will own their own home and we will just own the lot. Now, we also do different things like a rent credit program to help that tenant pay off their home with payments, but our model is not to own the homes. Okay. And so I do hear that it's difficult, or one of the benefits about mobile home parks is that once you, they move in there, they rarely move, right? So that's definitely a positive. So what do you do about purchasing a mobile home park that maybe is you know 70 80 percent occupied how do you get people to actually move in there when it's so rare that people move their mobile homes yeah that's a great question so first off we'll we'll get the get the mobile home park on the map a lot of these mom and pop owners don't even have a google places page for their properties they don't have a website for their properties so we'll get it on the map and that usually spikes demand because people literally will call our managers all day long asking if we have anything available and then I'll go out as my, my experience as a Lonnie dealer, I'll find used homes and bring those in. We also use some new home programs and bring in new homes. And then we'll advertise those homes on Facebook marketplace, Craigslist, et cetera, to increase, you know, showing requests. And then after we get an app application in, we'll do a full background check and fill those homes. But it's really just bringing in the homes. I also own my own mobile home transport and installation business. So that helps me expedite things when I take on a big turnaround project. Okay. And so when you do take over a park that has existing homes on there, is the plan just to sell those back or do you just completely get rid of them depending on the, the, the shape of them? Yeah, it depends, you know, if the homes are in great shape or not, uh, what, what, type of plan we'll have with that. Uh, most of the time we'll get the tenant on like a rent credit, you know, kind of, uh, you know, seller finance deal where they're, they're buying the home in monthly installments from us uh, b because we don't want the homes. Uh, if the homes are in really bad shape, we'll sell them as like, you know, Hey, a handyman special, uh, or we'll give them just a really, you know, good deal. Uh, tax time is really big for us when people get their tax refund checks, they'll usually have a lot of cash. So we'll offer a promotion that time of year. So people can come in, pay off their homes cash 
and then get a reduced monthly rate down to lot rent. And once we do get the tenants to a lot rent only model, the, they're very sticky. You know, like you mentioned, our turnover rate is only four to five percent annually once the tenants own their own homes. Okay. And do you look for a certain type of median income that your residents um, have when they move in? Are there any criteria as far as their incomes? We do look at their income. We want to make sure that their monthly gross income uh, is, you know, their, their rent, their total rent payment, their housing expense will be less than 33% of their total gross monthly revenue. Okay. So much like multifamily in a sense. Okay. Yep. And so you would think that mobile home parks are typically in class C and class D areas. Are, are they all class C and class D? Is that the kind of uh, asset that you focus on or are there actually class A and class B types of assets? Yeah, my model is more of a class C, class B model, uh, kind of like the, the Holiday Inn Express model is, is what I'm aiming for with all age communities. Now there's, you know, the other side of the spectrum with like equity lifestyle, where, you know, Sam Zell has these very amenity rich 55 and older communities in coastal states, you know, so there's a broad spectrum, you know, from class A which would have a swimming pool, a rec room, you know, someone that uh, events coordinator, you know, bingo on Tuesdays, that kind of model. And then there, you know, it, it scales down from there. Okay. How are you able to build teams and manage communities in six different states? You even said it earlier is that you want to make sure you're with an operator with boots on the ground. So they're not traveling back and forth when they're going through the value add process. So how have you been able to be successful? Yeah, we've been very successful finding really good on-site managers uh, that we will hire and they will be our you know, eyes and ears. And then we've also hired some really great asset managers that are out of our corporate office that will visit the properties once a quarter and you know, do annual inspections. And that's been very important to us. So we have about six employees out of our corporate office that deal with asset management. We have a collections manager and we also have a bookkeeper on staff that help keep everything organized so that when we do send out our quarterly reports to investors, you know, everything is very professional. All right. Great. The lead is going to take us into our final four questions. Are you ready? Sure. All right, Andrew, what is the one tool you use in real estate investing that you cannot do without? Uh, I would say right now it's our software called rent manager. We use that across all of our thousand units and that is, is really, really a nice software for, for our business. Great. Can you tell us a story about your biggest mistake in real estate investing so far and the main takeaway for our listeners? Yeah. So when we first bought our, our first park in Edwardsville, Illinois, uh, you know, I'm from Florida. So I completely underestimated the power of winter. We closed on that property in June and by January we had, we had several water leaks due to our water lines and uh, water meter crocs. Uh, where the water risers come up and go and connect into the homes, we had them breaking and leaking. So we would have water leaks, you know, throughout our parks. So that was, that was something that we lost thousands of dollars on because of these leaks. Uh, now every year in the fall, we have a, a handyman go through and inspect all of our, our meters and all of our water lines to make sure that they're insulated and heat taped. That's something that I would say is much different than multifamily. You know, these are mobile homes. They're not you know, connected to the ground, they do have a underbelly, and they will leak if if frozen. So that was one, a big learning curve for us. But, you know, we learned from it and move forward. Yeah. What is it that you need to do now to grow your life to the next level? Uh, you know, I would say hiring good people, you know, to get the right people on the bus. You know, in the beginning, I, I hired kind of friends and family, right, because that's who I trusted. Uh, we, you know, recently we've moved to hiring people that are experienced and like our bookkeeper that we just brought on board. We're really excited about her, you know, 30 years of experience. So, you know, hiring experienced people is, is what's going to help us grow. Awesome. And finally, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, people can find out more about me on keelteam.com. That's my website. That's K-E-E-L-T-E-A-M.com. Awesome. It's always great to learn about different asset classes and diversity is a beautiful thing when investing in real estate. So great interview, Andrew. We really appreciate you being on our show. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Andrew.